are having a good time so far. Um, but we will also be telling us about the Institute of Social Studies. Okay, thank you. Uh, good to see you all here. It seems like only yesterday since I saw. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry, it was only yesterday. <laughs> 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 Um, but I, I, I'm not here to do uh, ISU stuff here today. Uh, I'm here to talk about uh, another organisation at the, uh, the last space stuff. It's space stuff uh, in, in, in game. Uh, I spoke about the British Interplanetary Society, uh, an organisation that was, uh, uh, is approaching its 80th birthday. Um, today I'm going to talk about an organisation that's a little bit newer. Uh, the Institute for Interstellar Studies has now existed for 41 days. So, uh, uh, slightly different sort of time frame. Uh, so, the Institute for Interstellar Research, or sorry, Interstellar Studies, uh, was established on the 14th of September this year. Uh, it seeks to become a nexus for activities uh, and related activities to the challenges of achieving robotic and human interstellar flight. So, that's what it's all about. It's all about human beings and robots going to the stars. Uh, it's similar in many ways to the British Interplanetary Society because when the BIS was founded in the 1930s, that was about another equally ridiculous idea, that of human beings traveling into space and launching things on rockets. Um, arguably, interstellar travel is uh, significantly more difficult than that. Uh, um, but a lot of people sort of uh, think it's impossible. Maybe it will turn out to be impossible, but uh, the I4IS exists to try and make it, you know, if not possible, marginally less impossible. Um, it actually has very strong connections with the BIS. Really, it goes back to uh, to these things. These are the uh, for those people interested in interstellar studies, the famous red frontage covers of the Journal of the British Interplanetary Society that were produced uh, between 1974 and 1991. Each colour had a kind of different theme, and the red ones, as you can see there, were interstellar studies. Uh, and in this, uh, you know, each time it came out, there were a whole series of papers about different topics relating to interstellar studies. You know, possible designs for starships, uh, explanations of, uh, you know, why we can't see uh, aliens out there if they're there, uh, how to communicate with aliens if we find them, uh, and so on. So, kind of speculative stuff, uh, obviously. Uh, the BIS also uh, conducted uh, an actual design study on an interstellar starship. This was the, the so-called Daedalus study. Uh, it was a robot starship uh, designed to conduct a flyby of Barnard Star, which is about six light years away. Uh, it would uh, use fusion uh, gathered uh, using helium-3 uh, mined from uh, the atmosphere of Jupiter. So you had to have a fairly robust interplanetary infrastructure in the first place because you have to go to Jupiter and mine the, the helium-3. Uh, and the purpose of the mission was to enable it to take place and fly by another star in one human lifetime. And we've since seen a sort of, kind of resurrection of this sort of idea with the 100 year Starship uh, project, the idea that's uh, been put forward by NASA and DARPA uh, in, um, to uh, develop technology within the next 100 years to allow us to launch our first interstellar mission. Um, to give you a size of the scale, you probably can't see it, okay, but those are the people just there, okay? It's quite big, okay? Most of these tanks are full of uh, little pellets with helium-3 in, which are then dropped into here, and you can sort of see there, they're then zapped with electron beams, causing them to fuse and uh, accelerate the craft. And it comes in two parts, there's, there's this stage here, the first stage, and then the second stage that accelerates it uh, up uh, to... Uh, 12% of the speed of light. So that was, uh, I think for many years, the, the most complete study of a, of a possible interstellar starship. Uh, since then, there's been a follow-on project, uh, Project Icarus, okay, which is still underway. Uh, this has led to a number of uh, you know, other activities. Some of you may have heard of the Tau Zero Foundation, uh, which was set up by the guy who used to work at, at NASA on their breakthrough uh, propulsion physics program. When the funding on that got stopped, he set up the Tau Zero Foundation. That focuses mainly on propulsion, okay? The, the, the remit of I4IS is much, much broader than that. What is I4IS about? Well, this is its mission, uh, six bullet points. Uh, we seek to make new artificial and natural habitats while finding a way to improve the Earth and help the life that has nurtured. 
We conduct credible research into science and technology of starships. We work towards a capable and confident human species in interplanetary space. We inspire and motivate the public about the achievements of space exploration and give optimism for the future. We aspire to foster and create a star colonizing civilization and we search the universe and seek out intelligent life elsewhere. Uh, and embedded in some of, those, some of those aspirations, some of those mission points, uh, are some sort of fundamental views uh, of, of the Institute, which is that we, we don't want to do a kind of um, politically inspired flags and salutes interstellar mission. We don't want to just get to the stage of being able to launch a starship and go, there we go, we've done that, forget that. It's got to be self-sustaining. It has to be part of a continued evolutionary growth, growth of human beings first out into the solar system, establishing a solar system-wide civilization using the resources of the solar system, and then, okay, after we've colonized the solar system, moving on okay, to colonize the stars. That's the purpose. Not a sudden one-shot mission, there we've done it. It's got to be sustainable in the longer term, which is why there are all these other things. It's not just we will develop starships. So in terms of kind of broad research areas that the Institute is planning to, uh, in the future, uh, uh, research, we say we're only 41 days old, so haven't had a great deal of time to raise money and do all those other things and get things going. Still a kind of virtual institute at the moment. Uh, it's uh, split into a number of areas, so I won't read the bullet points, but uh, you know, life science uh, and uh, evolution is uh, one of them. That covers the kind of uh, biological aspects, politics and economics, because any way you look at it, this is going to be incredibly expensive. It's going to take a, a significant portion of humanity's wealth, because in order to do this, it's going to use so much energy that we can't even conceive of it. Even to send a comparatively small interstellar mission to a nearby, to a nearby star in a reasonable period of time would take many, many years of our current terrestrial energy output. You know, would we all agree to go without electricity for 10 years so that we could launch a starship? No. Okay? Uh, I like the idea of starships. I like the idea of interstellar travel. I'm not suggesting we should turn off civilization for 10 years and, you know, and put all the energy into making antimatter so we can... That would be stupid. Um, so we're not going to do that. We have to be in a situation where we can, we can generate and store and spare that much energy uh, in order to be able to launch these sorts of missions. So we need to get the politics right, we need to get the economics right, we need to have our technical and strategic roadmap drawn out, and then we need to work out which pieces of the puzzle we need to fill in in order to get to our final destination. This is not going to happen in 41 days, it's not going to happen in 41 years, okay? This is a very, very long-term project. Um, culture and philosophy are also important. Uh, you need the right sort of society, the right sort of culture, an outward-looking, optimistic, uh, culture that sees value in the future in order to pursue this sort of project. If you think we're all doomed to die, you know, in the comparatively uh, you know, near future, there's no point in doing this because we can't possibly achieve it. So you have to believe that humanity will persevere, uh, will continue to exist, and will be able to run these sort of missions, uh, you know, over many years, many decades, uh, multiple centuries. Um, I shall move through these points: life science and evolution, engineering, and physical sciences. This is obviously where most of my interest is in as a, as a sort of physicist turned engineer, uh, but they are all, uh, all, all important. Um, and then we have to come up with uh, ideas, as I say, for colonizing uh, you know, the solar system before we start doing the, the actual mission, so Mars colonization, space tourism, planetary exploration, deep space activities, all of these are needed uh, along the way. Uh, so who is, who are the Institute for Interstellar Studies? Well, these are our five directors, and the man at the top there, Kelvin Long, he is uh, probably the guy who has uh, done most to, uh, to bring it into uh, to fruition. He was one of the founders of Icarus Interstellar, uh, which is, uh, say, the, the people doing the follow-on study. Uh, he was uh, a key player in the uh, successful bid for the 100-year Starship project. Uh, uh, and then we have this other team, George Abbey Jr. You may have heard of George Abbey uh, Jr.'s father. Uh, he was uh, very deeply involved in the Apollo mission. You've got to kind of choose astronauts and, uh, uh, who flew and things like that. And then a bunch of people you probably haven't heard of. Uh, Rob Swinney, his ex-Air Force, 
Uh, Pauna Mangis is a, a, a UK, a, a sort of a, a US businesswoman uh, with, a, with a track record of technical innovation in space projects, and, and Jeremy Clark is the finance guy. So these are the five directors, you know, selected um, to uh, you know run the uh, run the institute on a sort of a day by day basis. Um, it has an advisory council. Uh, some of these people, some of you may have heard of, Greg Matloff uh, is, is well known in uh, uh, in space astronautics in solar circles. Uh, he's uh, an expert in solar sailing and, and interstellar propulsion. Uh, some guy called Chris Welch, I don't know who the hell he is. Uh, Freeman Dyson, who's heard of a Dyson sphere? Who knows what a Dyson sphere is? Okay, okay, he's the guy who invented Dyson spheres. He was also uh, very uh, heavily involved with a, with a program back in the uh, back in the 1960s, uh, using sort of uh, small atomic devices. They weren't exactly bombs, but you'd be forgiven for calling them that to propel a spacecraft. Project Orion. For those of you who've heard of Project Orion, you were the people behind that. Giovanni Valpetti again, uh, many years of contribution to uh, to interstellar research. Uh, Ian Crawford is a UK academic who works at. Uh, uh, Birkbeck College of the University of London. Uh, he's one of the UK's biggest proponents of human spaceflight um, uh, and a planetary scientist by background. Uh, Claudio Michoni is uh, he studied in the UK, a strong UK connect <coughs> connection here, I think, because uh, Kelvin is from the UK. Uh, he is, uh, again, another very well known um, researcher in the interstellar field. David Baker, I'm oh, sorry, Mr. Roman. Roman Kejerowski, uh, he uh, works at the uh, works in New York at one of the universities there. He is a physicist. His father was a physicist. His two brothers are physicists. His children are physicists. They, I think, they kind of quite like physics. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, and, and again, uh, uh, well known for writing, you know, many papers in the area of interstellar studies. David Baker, uh, British uh, scientist, engineer, started off working on the Apollo program for NASA back in the 60s. Uh, since returned to the UK, and now edits the BIS Spaceflight magazine. Uh, and if you type his name in you, um, and, and look for space books, you'll find he's authored a number of general space books uh, down the years, uh, including one with enormous big heavy one, so I could be a space one. And then a whole bunch of consultants, I haven't put their names up. These are people who are supporters of I4IS. Um, the, they, uh, they don't you know, work for it full time, but they're prepared to make their, uh, their expertise available. I can't go through all of them, uh, obviously, but top right here, this is Professor Colin McGuinness from the University of Strathclyde, uh, one of the world's foremost experts in, in solar sailing and the application of control engineering to the assembly of large structures in space. Uh, top left over there, Alan Bond, if you've heard of Hotol or Skylon, the aerospace planes, he is the man behind there. He has a company called Reaction Engines in the UK. Uh, he's a, uh, you know, a, a kind of minor engineering god in the UK space community, I, I, I would say. Uh, uh, other people, uh, yeah, Mark Hemsel, a former professor at the University of Bristol in the UK. Now he's the director of future projects for Reaction Engine. Uh, <coughs> Uh, and so on and, and, and so forth. So the, and the thing you will notice about these people all right, is that most of them either have no hair or grey hair. Right? <laughs> By which I mean, this isn't, uh, uh, and I, I hesitate to say this in a room full of young people, this isn't a bunch of idealistic young people going, woo, let's set up a thing. This is a, this is a bunch of idealistic old people. <laughs> you know, grizzled, cynical, you know, being beaten down, the things that, that you know, that, that Alan has been through in order to get Skylon sort of, uh, uh, you know, off the ground as a, as a, as a project, even to the stage it is now, is, 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 is unbelievable. But these are people who even though, uh, you know, they, they are, you know, hardened engineers, uh, you know, they have academic reputations, they have companies, you know, they believe that this sort of admittedly very speculative work is still worth doing because out there is a future of possibilities and we cannot be sure. The ultimate tragedy would be if there was a possibility, okay, and we ignored it. So these are some of the projects that uh, I4IS will be undertaking. One is called Oak Tree. This is to characterize all the nearby star systems within 20 years. Not to actually, in, in this project, to send probes to it, but to gather together all the information that we have 
about each of these star systems. There's a lot of information out there, but it's in different places. So the idea is to produce a database where there's access to details of all these uh, um, uh, systems so that we uh, can, can better know, because these, one of these will be our first destination uh, in all likelihood. Uh, another one, this is the Bussard Interstellar Ramjet. Um, uh, I will resist the temptation to some test some of my students to see if they were paying attention in the lecture 10 days ago uh, about what a Bussard Interstellar Ramjet is. But basically, it's a fusion powered spacecraft. Uh, it uh, is intended to scoop up interstellar hydrogen and use that as the material uh, for the fusion engine. Uh, it's not without its problems. Uh, uh, everybody got very excited when it first came out back in the 60s, uh, but it still looks like a, you know, a reasonably interesting prospect, so I want to have a, have a very thorough look at that one. Um, search for non-terrestrial intelligence near Earth light years. This is what happens when people are determined to make an acronym out of something. You, know, you can imagine, yeah, we've got search for non-terrestrial intelligence near Earth, but that, that just says Sent in, that's no good. I know, we'll add light years on it and make it into, into, into a sentinel. Um, but anyway, this is attempting to address some aspects of the Fermi paradox. People know, who knows what the Fermi paradox is? Just so if we, uh, few. Okay, the Fermi paradox in brief is if you take a few basic assumptions about there being intelligent life out there, them being able to build starships, them being able to move from star to star, you get this top, let's say, one star, the star, then they build this network, and they build this network. By now, if they were out there, they should have colonized the galaxy. Okay, even traveling at sub-like speeds, at a fraction of the speed of light, the galaxy should be full, okay, if intelligent life has emerged earlier in the history of the universe. And so the Fermi paradox is, where are they? Okay, number of potential explanations to this one, obviously, they're not there. Uh, two. Uh, intelligent life doesn't do this. Three, they kill themselves off. Four, we're in a zoo. You know, uh, it's one of the explanations. You know, they don't want to come near us. You know, apart from occasionally come down and you know do things with probes, maybe just to kind of wind people up. Um, the question is, though, would we recognise the signs of an advanced civilization if we saw it? And that's we, we're assuming that we would recognise alien artifacts. Would we? The Dyson Sphere, okay, is an idea where you take all the planets and all the asteroids in the solar system and you match them up and you do a, a big sphere around a star and you capture all of that star's energy. And so the only thing that will come out from that is that this globe will heat up and it will radiate in the infrared, obviously. Now, if these sort of very, very advanced civilizations were doing that, would we recognize that as a sign? Would we be able to detect it? We don't know. And so, uh, this is to try and look out and see if we can see any additional signs. Uh, there's this thing here, the Unruh effect. The Unruh effect is a uh, effect. It, it's interesting. It's one of those edgy areas of physics. Nobody, no, no physicist I know really deny that the Unruh effect takes place. And this is the fact that when you move through space, if you're accelerating, you will detect a different thermal environment from if you're stationary. So if I had a, if, if this was a thermometer and I accelerated it, in theory, the thermometer would experience, uh, you know, just travelling through a vacuum, it would experience an enhanced thermal environment. Not by very much, we're talking millions of a billionth of a degree here. But the equation that describes it's the same one that describes uh, the emission of Hawking radiation from black holes. Um, none, none of the physicists that I know say that that doesn't happen. They all agree the physics. The question is, does unradiation exist? Does this stuff get emitted, or does it get uh, an, you know, a net emission, or is it emitted and absorbed in, in equal quantities? If it is, if it does exist, can it then be uh, can it then be used in connection with uh, faster than light travel? I don't know. Uh, black hole applications for interstellar ramjets. We saw the interstellar ramjet. Can we do something with black holes, assuming that we knew how to make them, which obviously we don't. At the moment, but this is a this is actually a concept design for a spacecraft that would use a black hole. Uh, were we were we able to make them? Uh, another one, the Casimir effect. The Casimir effect is a is a is a uh, another one of these strange bits of physics. If you have two parallel plates and you bring them to, together very very closely, by which I mean nanometers, um, in conventional physics, there's nothing to write home about. But once you involve quant quantum mechanics, okay. Those two plates, because of the quantum field fluctuations between them, would experience a net force, either pushing them together or pushing them apart. 
uh, and, and this is, you know, this is genuine. Uh, the question is then can that sort of repulsive or compressive force be used in some way to generate power in any way and could this be a possible power source for interstellar flight? We don't know. That's why we want to look at it. Um, we will see. Uh, another one, okay, this is uh, looking at the, at the manufacturing uh, basically of antimatter. Can we find more efficient ways uh, to make, or more compact ways, should we say, to make antimatter, which can, uh, which can then be used to, uh, to power uh, fusion powered spacecraft uh, so that we can reach uh, higher fractions of the uh, speed of light. So, that's some of the projects. What else is happening uh, here? Uh, this is. This is this is where some of us called. Okay. <laughs> this is where we came to the, came from more yesterday, although it wasn't snowing uh, when we it left. It's it's like, I, I know it's snowing in Strasbourg right now, uh, such as the wonders of social media. Yes, yeah, it's snowing in Strasbourg. Life um, is going to set up uh, what it calls its academy, and in due course, it will start to it hopes offer scholarships and courses to students to encourage them towards careers in space. And, uh, you know, uh, the ISU master's uh, students who are here are in the midway of, of choosing their individual projects. They have to decide, I think, by Wednesday what their individual project's going to be this year. And some of those you will have seen on the list who were uh, in collaboration with NKI4IS. Okay, so uh, this, is, this is the first step of i 4 is to kind of uh, reach out to the edu higher education community and start to involve uh, uh, students and the next generation uh, in uh, projects related to uh, uh, interstellar study. Uh, another thing uh, it does is the Interstellar Index. This is, if you like, uh, our blog. Uh, this is where uh, you, can, you can see is a whole set of sort of Starship uh, R&D projects carried out by a whole range of people, not, not, not us. Um, different articles about different aspects of interstellar travel. Uh, it hopes to be a, a, you know, a, a if not a complete one-stop shop for people who are looking for information, a, a place for people who want to know about interstellar studies uh, to go. <coughs> so, final, final thoughts, uh, to give people time to ask questions. <coughs> the purpose of, of I4IS is to make a constructive contribution towards the ultimate goal of interstellar flight. We're not expecting this to happen soon, we're not expecting it to happen in any of our lifetimes. This is a, this is a long-duration, multi-generational project in all likelihood. The trick is, going forward, on the one hand, we have to have enough inspiration, enough vision to believe that it's worth doing, and at the same time, we have to have enough scientific rigor. You know, all of those ideas for those projects I put up there, I would guess that probably at least half of them turn out to be, you know, just complete fantasy. Okay? But, in the same way that NASA used to fund its breakthrough physics propulsion program, on the basis that you know, there might just be a small chance, it, it's, a, it's a pretty weird idea, but we'll put a little bit of effort into investigating some of, these, some of these bizarre concepts just in case they pay off. That's the purpose here. Um, uh, how we address the, uh, what, what I shall now call the, uh, the Rudy effect of seeing what you want to see uh, is, a very, is, is, is a very important one, you know, because obviously every, anybody who gets involved in this wants, I think, interstellar uh, travel to be possible. Uh, and the danger is always starting to starting to read things into research that aren't there. Uh, at the moment, okay, the, the institute is in its startup phase. Uh, there's a lot of work to go on, you know, after, you know, as I say, only 41 days in. From early 2013, uh, the institute expects to be open to collaborating with other organizations. We're not expecting to do all this ourselves. We, we, we can't, okay? We haven't got enough people, we haven't got enough uh, facilities. It's all got to be done in partnership with other organizations. In the meantime, though, if any of you are individually interested okay, uh, in, uh, in working uh, with the Institute or on anything, you can contact us and you can either tell me, obviously, since I'm here, and you can pass your name on to Kelvin, or if you want to go away and think about it and decide you know, whether, whether I'm a visionary or a lunatic, um, uh, and then decide whether you can, you can go to the web page and there's a contact form there and you can fill that out. Um, so if you want to find out more, that's the website, uh, i4is.org, uh, and the blog, the Interstellar Index is there. So, thank you very much for your attention. The last one to have is Uh, that the institute doesn't have enough 
facilities? Are there any facilities at the moment apart from human brains? But is it a kind of a UK project or? Uh, it's, it's, no, it's intended. I mean, it's based in the UK. It started in the UK, but it's not intended to be a UK only project. Uh, it's it's uh, it's similar to, as I say, to the 1930s situation where people set up, you know, rocketry societies. Um, except, you know, back then you could actually go to a workshop and make the components for a rocket, whereas, you know, building starships, you, you can't do that. So, so it's really going to be for many years. It's going to be essentially a, you know, a, a thinking kind of institute. Uh, with uh, you know experiments and, and practical work carried out uh, when we or people we can partner with you know have access to the appropriate facilities. Um, so, so your partners also um, also like gonna be the um, institutions um, who give you the money for the projects and the. Um, Potentially, uh, I mean, you know, we're hoping to find some uh, some some wealthy individuals who might, uh, who obviously, but then everybody's after, you know, wealthy individuals. Uh, there are other organisations, there's people like DARPA. We, you know, uh, I know we're talking to NASA again, but uh, it's probably not the right time to do that uh, uh, in the election year. It's not a good time to talk to ESA with the serial coming up. So. Um, you know, it's it's we're in this for the long haul. Okay, we're not expecting to make massive progress really, really quickly. The point is to start now. You know, so that uh, we can make some progress. Okay. Yeah, yeah, um, and the danger of being a little bit like rude, maybe, or stupid, um, considering the fact that there are normally like or there were to now like three major drives for doing exploration and mm -hmm. colonization. Basically, this term colonization already said it. It's basically to enslave people who are there and get a lot of rich money back. And probably there are no ones out there to enslave, and there are also no like resources together. And um, you said also that uh, you shouldn't do it just for like ramming your flag into some soil. Why exactly should we do it? Well, uh, I think the short answer is because if we stay here, we're all going to die eventually. <laughs> I mean, you know, the sun will eventually expand, the, the earth will be consumed by the sun as it moves into its red giant phase, and that will be the end of humanity. Admittedly, that's not going to happen for a few weeks yet, <laughs> <laughs> or many, many millions of weeks yet. But one has to face up to the fact that, you know, the universe is not static. Human beings have this tendency to think that the world is the way it is, you know. I mean, we were surprised by snow this morning. Good. It snowed in October. Who was expecting that? If we can be wrong about that, you know, I mean, you know, we're overdue for an ice age. I mean, that, that's very clear. I mean, argue it isn't about what, why that is. But everything we know shows us that in due course, this solar system will become uninhabitable and the Earth will be consumed by the sun. You know, that's not, you know, I mean, with current scientific knowledge, that's not a kind of crank view, that's what's going to happen, you know. Do we wish to still be here, or are our descendants to be here and see spring? I, human beings cause most of my problems in life, it has to be said, but as a species, I'm still quite fond of them. I'd hate for them to all disappear, <laughs> you know. Uh, and so I would like human beings to move out across the universe, colonize it, see the things that I can't see, you know, bad enough being stuck on one planet, you know. Um, I'm probably never going to see the Earth from orbit, but you know, I would quite like to see other star systems, other galaxies. I can't do that, but if I can't do that, I would like my descendants to do it. Uh, and that's probably why I do the job I do anyway, you know, yeah. handing, handing the torch on to the next generation. Okay, yeah, I have like, two questions. Why do we have some sort of prime director, do you think? Well, the Prime Director is quite interesting. I mean, bearing, bearing, bearing in mind, we're kind of waiting to see if they announce they found kind of, uh, you know, biogenic methane on Mars tomorrow. Uh, yeah. If they suddenly go, you know what, yes, there are microbes on Mars and you can't go there anymore, you know, for ethical reasons. You know, suddenly, whoa, everything will change. So we wait and see what happens uh, the next day or two. But I mean, you know, is it better that there is life out there or, or not? From one point of view, if it's not, then we don't need to feel guilty about going out there and colonizing it. If we suddenly go out and we find that every single planet's got life on it, well, then we're, you know, we're faced with a whole series of kind of you know, ethical and philosophical questions about our, our rights to impose ourselves on other ecosystems. I don't know what the right answer to that one is, really. Though, you know, I'm a wimpy vegetarian, so you know, I tend to feel sorry for other life forms. <laughs>
Okay, I think we're out of time tonight, but I'm pretty sure this will be available for more questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be here. Thank you very much.